Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Against all odds, Donald J. Trump is now the 45th president of the United States. He has set out a starkly different agenda. Can he make America great again? To crosstalk the start of the Trump presidency, I'm joined by my guest here in Moscow, Gilbert Doctaro. He is the European coordinator of the American Committee for East-West Accord. We also have Alex Christofora. He is the director and writer for the Duran.com. And we have Xavier Moreau. He is the founder of the Center for Political Strategic Analysis, Stratpol. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Alex, let me go to you first. Let's talk about the inauguration. Um, it wasn't typical. I think we would all agree. Um, I essentially saw it as a declaration of war, preparing the American people to defend their national interests. And we'll talk about the national interests of other people. One thing I want your opinion on, was Steve Bannon in the room, do you think, when that speech was written? Because those were Trump's words, no doubt about it. But I see Steve Bannon's fingertips, fingerprints. Fingerprints on it. I, th I think you're exactly right. I think uh, Steve Bannon was the, the architect of that speech, uh, even though obviously Trump had a lot of input into what was going to be said during the inauguration. But there was a very Breitbart-esque yeah. kind of feel to it. Yeah. And it was really Trump going into the lion's den, Washington, D.C., scolding Washington for eight, 16 years of, of, of havoc that they've uh, wrecked onto, onto the American public. He didn't mention, very much unlike Obama, I, I, all the time. He said we, he said our, and he was really talking to that middle America that, that really came out and voted to him. It was, it was a speech meant for them, and it was absolutely a declaration of war. And he didn't mention one European he, country. Absolutely. Gil, you know, the optics are everything for this. He, here we are, we have the entire political class of both parties. Both parties are irrelevant right now, in my mind, in the beginning of this presidency. And what he had to say about them, with these former presidents sitting around, and, and, and basically um, tr trashing a good bit of uh, uh, Barack Obama's uh, legacy, which he did a, a couple hours later with executive orders here. Talk about the optics of that. What kind of message is he sending? Because I think it showed a lot of bravery. Now, the man has been brave since, he, since the electoral campaign. He's been quite stunning in his willingness to say things that are totally unacceptable to the establishment. And in the remarkable thing is that he used the opportunity of his inauguration speech to continue and expand on precisely those points and to reassure his electorate that he is not abandoning them and that he's, we do not have a new Trump uh, reaching agreement with the consensus, reaching agreement with uh, all of those who brought us into this havoc yeah. in the future, that he is going to go his own course. No, but it was really interesting is that, you know, traditionally we see, we, well, obviously we had a very contentious campaign, right, uh, finishing up, and, and uh, there's still a state of shock, particularly with the media, that uh, Trump is now president here. But usually you reach across the aisle, as we say. He didn't reach across <laughs> no. any aisle whatsoever. He really was, came out, you know, um, uh, firing, you know, and it was, and it's I think this is, and I think yeah. the, he's, he spoke to the heartland. That was the speech was for them. I think he's definitely a fighter. And uh, it talked it talk only for America and for the Americans. It was a very, in my opinion, it was a very great speech. And uh, it's, uh, I'm uh, fully optimistic because if we are talking about only the U.S. national interest, there is no U.S. national interest in Ukraine, in Syria, in all this place where they have to send uh, some soldiers to spend some money. So I think we are in a good way and to, to solve the, the global situation in the world. If you maintain this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this way. And, and, and on what you said, it was also also a very simple speech. Yeah. Time-wise, it was, it was only very six, short. Very yeah. short, 16 minutes. I think Obama's speech was over 40 minutes when. Uh, when but he didn't he, say he anything. Yeah, yeah, he didn't yeah, say yeah, a thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but it was a very simple speech, and it spoke a lot about to what Trump is as as a man. He's his marketing genius is his simplicity. You know, the make America great again, a very simple, catchy yeah. phrase. And that speech and was, you know, was Alex, simple. You know, if you were to ask me, you know, what was the substance of the speech, I'd say it was three things: jobs, jobs, and jobs. Yeah. You know, Gil, let, let, me, let me give you a quote that really stood out in my mind here. This is on, at the inaugural. We will seek friendship and goodwill with the nations of the world, but we will uh, do so with understanding that it is right for all nations to put their own interests first. 
that is something an American president would never say, particularly since the end of the Cold War. This is starkly different. Mm. Yes, it's a denial of the ideology that has that, been governing. Exactly. exactly. Uh, it's not a set of principles, not separate principles. It's an integrated ideology. The peculiar thing is that after the, the end of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union ceased to exist and Russians uh, abandoned all ideological pretensions for the sake of getting rich, uh, America, went the, America went the other way and found solace in a new ideology which had this universal values, democracy promotion, regime change as its fundamental principles mm -hmm. and has gotten us into one catastrophe after another. And in these simple words, uh, Donald Trump rejected and rebutted these points of ideology that have been guiding our foreign policy. Not only did he not reach across the aisle, but he but he uh, rejected actually both sides, both exactly. aisles, <laughs> and presented himself as an in, the independent man, which he uniquely is. It's really interesting because he, 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 there was no political parties. He didn't even talk about that a, a, at all here. Um, he was very forceful in a very po uh, populist way. Is that you, the people? Yeah. You know, we're shifting like back, the back the power. power to, yeah. That is an amazing. Again, when you consider the. Yeah. Um, uh, the foreign policy and financial blob that was sitting behind him, a complete rejection of that. And is this going to be a spillover effect? I mean, again, this is not ideological, and I think this is, uh, the media certainly doesn't understand it. In my opinion, it's completely different what we have uh, till now. And for instance, when you were talking about borders, we were supposed to protect the borders of the others, but we didn't protect our borders. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very uh, uh, America uh, turn uh, speech, and uh, in my opinion, it's just starting. because. If he had to start something different, you know, if he was only his campaign uh, making some populist uh, speeches, he, he, he has already started to change. But now we see that he has everybody, I mean, the system is all against him, all the Republicans, well, he, as you told, George Bush. The thing and that gives Obama. me hope is that he got elected, so maybe yeah, he, he could get elected, okay. maybe he could yeah, do this. Yeah. Um, uh, Alex, um, um, Chuck uh, Schumer, the, the Democrat from New York. This is what he said a few minutes right. before um, Trump. Um, gave his speech that we're talking about right now. Whatever our race, religion, sexual orientation, <laughs> gender identity, whether we are immigrant or native born, whether we live with disabilities or not, uh, in wealth or in poverty, um, we are all exceptional in our common held yet fierce um, devotion to our country and in our willingness to sacrifice our time, energy, and even our lives to be, to making a more perfect union. This is the junk <laughs> that he yeah. was attacking, yeah. okay? He didn't say political correctness. All the things I just mentioned, they're not all equal. They're not all equal, okay? And this is this mm. multicultural mass, this Frankenstein monster that has been created over the last 40 years. And he, I hope he starts dismantling it. It's exactly why the Democrats lost. It's yeah. Once again, you have yeah. Schumer going yeah. to identity politics. Yeah. Everything he said in that, in that sentence that you just read out is the reason why Americans got so fed up with what's happening in the country the political correctness, the identity politics. And here's a man, Trump, who gets on stage and just starts talking about jobs, you, your family, security, security a better living. Who cares about what's going on in Ukraine and Syria and all the things we're tangled yeah. up in? It's all about you and the power's and, coming back and to when you. It, all, it divides people. This is a divisive yeah. agenda. Yeah. And that senator's words are divisive. That's why the Democrats lose. It, it's exactly the same when Mattis was in front of the Congress. One of the senator, a Democrat one, asked him 10 times, do you think that uh, LGBT will undermine our defense? <laughs> and uh, the poor General <laughs> Mattis <laughs> repeating that, uh, I don't care. I just want to make the, defense uh, the U.S. defense instrument efficient. That's my only problem. But do you think that the LGBT <laughs> will undermine... I think I've answered that question, yeah. Senator. You know, you know, Gil, I can't save him, actually. Gil, I <laughs> was really interesting. Before I watch the um, inaugural address, I, I watch it on the streaming app, uh, for, uh, from RT. I did flip over to Young Turks and CNN. And they covered it as if it was a funeral procession. You know? But you know, it was a funeral. Mm -hmm. It was a funeral for them mm -hmm. and their coverage of the of the campaign and of uh, president elect and, and and from what i saw of pre uh, of president trump right now there's some there's um uh, a major shift here because of, of social media he's going to talk to his people directly mm -hmm. oh, I, I agree completely with your with what you're saying there there is um, um it is a funeral for 
And it is also uh, uh, a very difficult time for the 4,000 or so appo federal appointees uh, who are now being replaced by, tr by Trump's people uh, since their CVs don't carry much weight <laughs> with all the lobbyists and corporate, yeah. corporate oh, interests. Oh, too bad. So this I partly mean, explains this the This is the training of the swamp, isn't yeah. it? This is the training of the swamp. They here. take it very personally. It's not just an abstract ideological consideration. Well, you know, I think, you know, it's really interesting with the outcome of the election is that all of these political appointees were probably thinking, maybe we'll get a new mortgage, you know, maybe we'll do this, maybe that. And you know what? All of that came to naught, okay? Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump screwed up a lot of personal lives of these people, and they're not very happy about it first stop he made, official stop he made, was the CIA. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, and they applauded. And they were happy to see him. Of course, now he's president, and now he has the power. Mm -hmm. And I think the CIA understands they're going to have to work with him, and he understands he has to work with them. But in the speech to the CIA, he was still Trump. He still acted like Trump. He really, spoke like Trump. It was really folksy, was, wasn't it? Yeah, he it was, was really very folksy, and he, he made a couple of jokes. And, but, but his tone was still simple and to the point. And the CIA was, it seemed well, like they were very happy to see Isn't this a direct message, obviously, gentlemen, uh, to the, uh, the, the media saying that uh, Trump has problems with the intelligence community, uh, he's going to have trouble with them, they're against it. And when he, he, I think he was definitely saying the very opposite. Peter, I don't think the, the ball has stopped. Uh, yes, he's decapitated the CIA, and I'm sure other uh, agencies will have their, their bosses removed. But I think they're going to have to dig down a bit deeper. Oh, I agree. Because uh, yeah. there still will be people who want to sabotage uh, his program. Of this, you have to consider that the, the remaking of the State Department, the remaking Justice of the Justice Department and also. Justice, this goes back to 2002, 2003. Okay, Gil, uh, let me let uh, jump in here, gentlemen. Okay. We're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the start of Donald Trump's presidency. Stay with Artie. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing the start of Trump's presidency. Okay, Gilman, I'll go back to you. But right before we went to the break, um, I'm going to use my term. Um, uh, he needs to drain the swamp here. Mm -hmm. How difficult is that going to be? We, we, I have come across reports, um, again, this is from uh, the lamestream media, that they, there are not enough people want to work with this administration. And then they kind of change gears a little bit. You know, I think I can work with this guy. It's going to be about if the, he can work with them. I think he, they need to wake up to that. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, he has a lot of work to do. Uh, just removing the few key people at the top of the, secure, the <laughs> intelligence agencies or, um, or its state is not going to be sufficient. So Victoria Nuland will go. That's a wonderful start. That's a wonderful but there start. are a lot of pe people a little bit lower down. But we shouldn't be too optimistic that just removing the boss and the policies will change and they all will implement the, the new direction. Um, and Dick, we don't even Dick really Cheney, know what the new direction is yet, In 2002, okay. 2003, after the CIA had proved itself completely incapable of preventing the 2001 9-11 uh, attack, the, the, there was a purge of intelligence agencies. A lot of people with Russian expertise were chased out into the street. Um, yeah. And now, at this particular moment, we, we don't have that expertise. And this is the quite alarming mm -hmm. thing about all of the, the Russian hysteria that's come up in the, in the months before, before November 8th, that the intelligence agency did not have the competence in-house because they all had, had removed competence going back to 2003 and Cheney's purges. So there will have to be a good deal of homework done yep. to bring uh, all of these, these key players these key uh, uh, departments into line with the new intended well, policy. Well, Reince Priebus, you know, uh, I think, in, you know, because of his um, uh, truly amazing management of the, for the GOP, you know, you had the, 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 the chair of the party, when you had the donors abandon him, yeah. you, you had the, the political elite uh, within the party abandon him, and, and Reince Priebus was right there. I'm very glad to see that he's going to be chief of staff, and I think he's going to be a good gatekeeper. Go ahead. It will be interesting as well to know who will be the future ambassadors, 
because he fired everybody. And uh, usually, well, I hope that's not going to be pay for play like the Clintons yeah, did. Yeah, you know, okay. I hope we have some professionals because usually, you know, uh, they gave the, the uh, ambassador a place uh, to people who get some money for the campaign. So I would like, uh, and I hope that uh, Trump will show very uh, professional and effective uh, uh, ambassadors, and uh, it would be a, a good uh, sign, in my opinion, uh, uh, for the future. I think the other the other interesting point with uh, with everything we're discussing is. Trump's relationship to the press now. Oh, and that's I don't know exactly I where, I, where I wanted to go. Right, okay. If we saw Sean Spicer's yeah. uh, actually first press conference yeah. in which there well, was no questions. First questions informal. First, first informal, informal, right. No questions were, were taken. And he blasted he them. He destroyed them. And once again, what were the things that he was hitting on? You guys are just fake, fake news. news. <laughs> you, you fabricate everything from, from, from the, he talked about the crowds at the, at the event, to, to what was published about the event, to the protesters, to everything. That was an interesting way to start off the relationship between Trump and the media. And of course, Trump may not even care because he has Twitter. Yeah. As we're sitting in Moscow today, the question of uh, Trump's policy towards Russia has to be in our minds. And I think in this re connection, we have to consider who is whispering in his ear and what, are they, what recommendations they're giving. Now, there have been some very good whispering in his ear coming from Henry Kissinger and obviously Kissinger's points on how to deal with a Congress that is very much uh, in, the, in the old line thinking. Very hostile. Very hostile because it believes in universal values, does not want to hear about real politic or national interests guiding foreign policy. So Kissinger has been constructive in that way and I hope that he continues to be. However, at the same time, Kissinger uh, is locked into the box from which Trump wants to get out. And the box is um, this <clears throat> um, inability to see beyond uh, disarmament, a nuclear disarmament, as a way of reaching a, a new level of cooperation with Russia, when that is exactly what the Russians are not ready for. They're ready, they are waiting to see a whole new architecture of security in Europe and the world before they're willing to make concessions on nuclear you know, disarmament. You know, it, it, for me, the, the nuclear disarmament thing was interesting because uh, it's a, 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 a step above the kind of petty squabbling yeah. mm. that you know that had been you know, a lot of it is a result of uh, the uh, situation that was artificially created in Ukraine. And I think that's the kind of thinking right there. I don't think it's appropriate to link sanctions and a nuclear deal. It's a very odd linkage right there. But it is a way to start a conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's really key here. Instead of talking about you did this, you did that, you did this. What about we have what's something we have in common yeah. that needs to be done, nuclear disarmament is a good thing. Trump, and both countries could achieve it if there's the political will. Trump wants a deal. Yeah. And a, okay. and a right. deal is supposed to be uh, productive for all the parts. It's not sanctioned, it's not a threat attitude to be uh, till Trump. So uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not surprised that he's kind of, uh, of course it's something surprising that um, he will use a sanction against uh, nuclear weapons. But uh, in my opinion, as you told, it's uh, just starting a conversation and find a good deal. A good deal is the deal that will last the next five years and that will be uh, co uh, convenient well, for all the parts of the deal. That kind of deal would d uh, take care of probably the single biggest problem is the lack of trust on yeah. both sides right yeah. now. And, um, and, I, and I, I make it very clear to people when, they, when they're um, watching Russia is that I, I say it's not a Republican, it's not a Democrat. It's 25 years since the end of the of Cold course. War. This distrust has been built up and it's going to be very difficult to get over that. But, and that where, where you are talking about nuclear weapons, you are talking about the shield. Yeah. So, uh, because it break it break the, the balance between the nuclear uh, uh, powers between the U.S. and and, uh, and the Russia. So it's a global. It's a, of course it's a global agreement that we have to find now. And and, and everything with with Trump, uh, it can all be summed up in, in in one point that Trump's foreign policy is all transactional. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. and you said the exactly. word is real politic, and and that's just a drastic shift from this liberal religious fever that's yeah, yeah, yeah. gripped the United States yeah. and, and yeah. we saw it in, in in the protests and we saw it in the stars that came out and Madonna said she she wants to blow up the White House and, and all this rhetoric and don't, don't repeat uh, anything else she said on this yeah, program yeah, apparently. I won't. Okay. that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> till, till, now, till now everybody uh, in the West uh, knew that the sanctions are not efficient that the Russia will never give up so why continue this, this same politic? Because we won't go to war with Russia, so what, what we are going to do? There and, are and things mm -hmm. we can do mm -hmm. which will not require congressional approval and which will not cost uh, Donald Trump a great deal of political capital in the first days in office. 
as raising the sanctions would. Uh, and, there, and these things that he can do happen also to be of greater importance to the Kremlin than lifting sanctions. The first thing that he can do is order that there be no more of these provocative military exercises yeah. at Russian borders. The second thing he can do is take back those brigades that yeah. were just introduced into Poland a week ago. At the last moment. At the last moment. Mom. This type of confidence building is immediately available to him. And you know what, that, that kind of confidence building is that it is not words, it's not rhetoric, yeah. it's actions. Yeah. And this is something, actions are so much easier to understand than just empty words, which have been said for 25 years. How about if Trump makes all the uh, NATO members pay up the 2%? Yeah. How about that? <laughs> How about actions and put your money where your mouth is? Yeah. That would be interesting. No. Let's switch gears here, gentlemen. The media. Alex, is this going to be just trench warfare for the next four or eight years? Because I think Trump is said, OK, bring it on. Because I think he's very confident that the, the, the major news agencies have, have, have de delegitimized themselves so much that people are going to start tuning out. Yeah, it's never going to end. I think this is going to be four years, maybe eight yeah. years, of the, the greatest entertainer to enter the, the American scene, and that's Donald Trump. And love him or hate him, everyone is focused on what he has to say, what he has to tweet. Uh, you know, when he, when he sat down there, I, I didn't know this, but apparently there's a presidential um, office in the Capitol building, and he started signing his first executive orders. This is like within 90 minutes, two hours after he was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. He had his family, and he had uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, which put on her very fake, nervous smile. Um, uh, <laughs> apparently, he signed something and gave her the pen, and <laughs> when she found out what she, he signed, he, she wanted to give the pen back. But... My point in mentioning this here is that um, he looks presidential already. It didn't, the transition, the, yeah. the, he didn't need any time. You know, he, he sat said, in he said chair he and he started gonna, work. He said he was going to start work on Monday, but actually started work. Like he said, oh, 90 exactly. minutes yeah. right yeah. after the inauguration. So, so I think he's even learning to be a politician. He set the expectations really low, and he overachieved. He, he got to work right away, even though he said, I'm not going to do anything until all the partying is over and the celebration, and I'll get to work on Monday. He was working right away, signing executive orders. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. No, I'm sorry. But in, in my opinion, uh, some of the medias are going to join Trump. Exactly like um, John McCain started to do it uh, some, uh, some days ago, because now he's a president. And so it is a. It really gets down to, and I don't want to sound cliche here, but it, you know, at, at a certain point, you have to think about everyone, all of us, and something that is greater than us, okay? And whatever country you come from, that is a great cause, all right? And I, I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't, I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see it happen, but unfortunately, I don't think it will happen. I, I think these people in the media are so ideologically driven. It is just their, gene, uh, their, their genetic code. They're not going to be able to break they out of it. They can't be pragmatic. But, but they can't be cut off from the source of information. They can't be denied the right to, to ask questions at a press conference. Yeah, but, this is but, they, vital but, but to other their... people should be able to ask questions yes. too. They should widen out the spectrum mm -hmm. a little bit because they have their little monopoly in the, press, in the press office. The press generally, what you see in the newspapers generally, has been going back 30 years, has been primarily press releases, which are then uh, written, rewritten over the name of the journalist as if they are as if they're fresh reports. But the basic material has come from the government's own journalists working as PR artists. And that is not going to change. I, I was, re during his, during Trump's uh, press conference a week, a week and a half ago, um, he mentioned in passing, when, 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 uh, he, when the suggestion was made that he take a question from the BBC, he said, oh, there's another beauty. Another beauty. Right. <laughs> I, was, I was stunned this morning to see how responsive even the BBC has been to this threat of losing access. Yeah. This morning they had in their coverage of the, of the de women's demonstrations yesterday, they were interviewing for 10 or 15 minutes a woman Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> who it said that she loves Trump. No. So <laughs> I'm sure of that. You know, they're, okay. they're not so right, brave. We're, yeah, we're, so we're, uh, we're, we're going to get a lot of surprises here, uh, I'm sure, for the next four years. We'll run out of time. Many thanks to my guests here in Moscow, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules. <laughs>